It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. The first voting in the 2016 presidential contest is still almost six months away, but most of us already feel besieged by a process that looks, well, weirder than ever. <laughs> the contest for the Republican nomination has been totally dominated by Donald Trump, a candidate that almost no political analyst believes could actually win the party's nomination, and certainly not the presidency itself. The Democratic side looks a bit more familiar, Despite some controversy and unexpected competition, Hillary Clinton still has a commanding position in the polls, but that was the case at this time eight years ago as well. And then her campaign fell apart in the face of a little known, inexperienced U.S. Senator named Barack Obama. Our guest today, as we sort through the big dynamics of our national politics, is Ryan Lizza, a senior editor and political correspondent extraordinaire at the New Yorker magazine. You also see him frequently on CNN. Brian, thanks hey, for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, is this democracy in action <laughs> or a disaster unfolding? I assume you're talking about Trump. I'm talking about the whole thing. The whole thing. Uh, well, look, um, we don't know what the staying power of Donald Trump is. I, I, I think back to covering 2012 when we had a pretty big field, not as big as the 17 Republican candidates, but it was, it was pretty large. And there were a series of candidates who rose, stayed atop the polls for one to two months, and then fell and disappeared into history before the party sort of regained its sanity and elected the guy that everyone thought was going to get it in the first place, Mitt Romney. Right. Let's remind ourselves of who some of those fleeting stars were. I mean, Herman Cain comes to mind. Herman Cain had, had almost two months of uh, Trump-like publicity back then. Michelle Bachman. Um, Rick Santorum was sort of the last guy standing against Mitt Romney. Newt Gingrich. Uh, and Rick Perry. So they, you know, there are some legitimate senators and governors in that, in that uh, group, but they all had one to two month long leads that were driven by media attention and debate performances. So I think everyone watching Trump, a lot of political analysts said, oh, this is the same phenomenon, right? This is all media generated. Um, I mean, CNN, which I'm associated with, uh, has treated Trump like the Malaysian, the missing Malaysian plane, right? It's been wall to wall <laughs> coverage nonstop. If you are getting wall-to-wall -wall coverage on every uh, network uh, news station and, and cable channel, your polls are going to go up because when a pollster calls you, um, it's the first name that pops into your mind. So, so in the beginning of this phenomenon, it was, is this just name recognition? Is this just people telling pollsters the first name that pops into their mind because they're all over the media? All right, now we're two months uh, or more into Trump dominating the polls, I think you have to start to think, well, maybe there's something more to this. Maybe his emphasis on immigration um, and this just sort of visceral make America great that doesn't really have a lot of policy behind it um, is, you know, activating a, about a quarter to a third of the Republican electorate in a, in a more substantial way. And maybe he has a chance to, to turn this into something more serious. Maybe it's not Herman Cain. Maybe it's more, more stay, he has more staying power than that. And I guess the other sign that that might be the case, uh, or that there is something more substantial happening, is that he has survived a number of the kinds of uh, sudden, uh, sudden missteps or uh, bad statements, the sorts of things he said about uh, the, uh, the, the Fox, uh, uh, Megyn Kelly, the Fox uh, uh, news person uh, in the, from the Republican debate and then other comments that he's made and the actions that he's taken. Those were the sorts of things that like Herman Cain, who we mentioned, for instance, uh, revelations of an apparent girlfriend knocked him out almost instantly. Yeah. Uh, those kinds of things don't seem to be having the same effect on Trump, like his, his rapist comment about Mexican immigrants. Uh, many people thought that was it. Okay, yeah. this is his moment. He's out. But he's survived all that. Traditional political rules don't apply to him because he's not running as that kind of candidate. He is, his whole appeal is that he says things and he, that other candidates won't say and that, look, and he, he crosses lines that other candidates won't cross, right? You put a line in front of him and dare him to cross it, and that's exactly what he does. And so after every one of these incidents, after calling Mexican immigrants rapists, after attacking Megyn Kelly, after uh, attacking John McCain, this unimpeachable POW, um, after, uh, you know, stories about his shifting ideology over the years, 
his numbers have continued to go up. And a so, little. A little, but he's, he's, you know, if you look at some of the state polls now, he's, uh, he's into the 30s now. Mm -hmm. You know, he was into, when he was in the teens and some of the other candidates were in the hunt, um, it wasn't as big a deal. But now, the last, you know, one of the recent polls has him into, into the 30s in New Hampshire. So he's um, also got money, right? And so those other candidates, you know, the old cliche in politics is campaigns, uh, campaigns don't end, they run out of money. Trump has several billion dollars. He's self-funding. It's one of the, you know, his points of appeal to a lot of people is he can't be bought, supposedly. And I think he's going to be around to the end if he's got that much money. Um, he's, he's got no reason to exit the race. But what does it say about the American people? I mean, both that, uh, that these issues are, uh, are these sort of blots that in the past would have knocked any candidate aside, don't seem to have that resonance anymore, certainly yeah. don't seem to affect this 25 to 30 percent group of the of Republican voters. But I think that's the point. I think it's, we're, we're making a mistake if we draw too much from a quarter uh, to a third of Republicans, remember only Republicans in these polls, um, supporting Donald Trump. And I think we're, we're making, that's not the American electorate, right? That is a sliver of the Republican presidential primary. Um, so more people are, are, not, are, are supporting non-Trump candidates than are supporting Trump candidates even within the Republican Party, right? So this, I don't think we can draw broad conclusions about the American electorate, but there is a significant part of the Republican base that disagrees with the Republican Party establishment on a few crucial issues. The big one, of course, is immigration. If you, I mean, there's some history here. If you go back to 2012 when Mitt Romney lost, the RNC did an extremely transparent, soul-searching report and said, here's why we lost and here's how we can win in the future. And what were the two things? And the biggest thing was we need to reach out to non-white males, right? And the way to do that, if we want to reach into the Latino community, is to pass comprehensive, comprehensive immigration reform. Now, that has a meaning in the, in the Washington political debates. It means border security plus a pathway to citizenship. So that's the elite of the party saying we lost because we can't, we don't have a future with non-white voters. And to do it, we have to change our tone on immigration, and we actually have to set this policy in motion. Well. 2013 came, 14, they tried to pass that legislation, and there was an uprising among the Republican grassroots that killed it for, I don't know, the fourth or fifth time in the last 10 years. Going into the primaries, Reince Priebus, the head of the Republican Party, was making the same case. Stay away from this issue. Watch your tone and how you talk about immigration and immigrants. Donald Trump just took a daisy cutter to that entire strategy, right? <laughs> Um, and just completely exposed this rift between the grassroots of the party and the elites on, 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 on the strategy of how to broaden the appeal of the party. And I think it's going to do damage to whoever the candidate is in the general election. But one thing I'm curious about is whether you see this as a truly new phenomenon or if in reality there has always been this, this faction of more conservative voters. Look, I think there are structural issues in the economy um, and that lead some voters uh, to a, a Donald Trump-like candidate who seems to have some superficially, superficially, um, you know, appealing answers to a lot of really, really tough problems, right? We've had stagnant median incomes in this country now uh, since, uh, for, for decades now, right? And so people want to understand why that is. And so, you know, it's not, it's not new to blame that on immigration or to blame that on free trade deals, which are the two issues he's really seized on. What is new and different for the, on the Republican side of the equation is the broader demographics of the country. And yeah. the number of white voters is declining precipitously, much faster than we once predicted, and Hispanics and other minorities are on the rise. Yeah. So does the Republican Party face a kind of impossible equation for the future? Um, basically, the white share of the electorate has been declining about two points every uh, four years, right? So Mitt Romney, uh, if, uh, if, his, if his election had, had happened uh, a few cycles ago, he would have been president because he did so well with white voters. Um, he lost the presidency because he got absolutely um, killed among non-white voters. And not just, uh, you know, not just African Americans, but Latinos, Asian Americans, really across the board. And so there is actually a debate within the Republican Party about whether they should reach out um, and increase their share of the white vote, or if they should pursue policies that would increase their share of non-white votes. 
to me, it's a, it's a sort of depressing debate and conversation because it, what, and what has truly happened in the last few cycles is the electorate has become more polarized along racial lines. And, you know, that's not a healthy thing for any democracy. I think most countries that we, you know, we, we look at historically where the electorate is completely polarized that way, um, you know, bad things happen. Um, and the converse of this is also notable in, in that the Democratic Party, more so than even a lot of Democrats want to fully confront, uh, has become so overwhelmingly reliant on African American voters. The Democrats have this sort of this natural new majority. Some people call it the you know the Obama majority, of um, you know basically white progressives uh, and labor and uh, and these rising minority populations. And that's so, the Hillary Clinton equation. You just laid it yeah. out. Exactly. Are there any other Democratic candidates, any other people who are being talked about who would have any possibility of assim reassembling the Democratic coalition in the way that Barack Obama reassembled things and defeated Hillary Clinton that time? You can't assume that the voters who came out to elect and reelect Barack Obama will do the same for Hillary Clinton, that the historic support he had in the African-American community will just translate to, to her for, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, but of course, you know, maybe she has a more natural advantage uh, among uh, women. Maybe she would pull in some Republican women uh, in a general election. If you're just looking at the Democratic primary, I think it's very, very hard to see how any candidate puts together a coalition that could defeat her. I mean, the entire Democratic Party has sort of organized itself around her candidacy, candidacy in a way that hasn't happened in the modern era. I mean, Al Gore as a sitting vice president didn't even have the sort of dominance that she has right now. And how do you beat her? You have to do what Barack Obama did, right? He, he, um, he stole a sort of one of the, the pillars of her coalition going into that primary. The Clintons, people forget this now because there was so much drama in 2008, but the Clintons had enormous support in the African-American community. And going into 2007 and 2008, she was the candidate uh, that polled uh, the best in the African-American community. It wasn't until Obama won Iowa where that support shifted and he stole one of the pillars of her support. Can Joe Biden or Jim Webb or Martin O'Malley uh, steal one of those constituencies? I don't think so. Now the negative is, and we've seen this showing up in the polls, although I think it's been a little exaggerated in the media, there is some softening in her approval rating, right? She, when she was Secretary of State, she, her, her approval was in the 60s, right? When politicians are not in the fray, they're really, really popular. As soon as they take positions and start mixing it up and take sides on, on issues that are controversial, people start to remember why they didn't like them. Uh, add to that the, the, the media scrutiny that has come along with her candidacy. And we have this very complicated uh, email scandal, which I, th you know, I think a lot of Republicans are hoping, wishing, thinking it's going to be the, the end of her. Other people arguing it's probably not going to be a big deal. Um, Where are you but, on that? Pause for a second. You know, I, mean, I, I mean, is it a big deal? I haven't seen any evidence of, you know, that she uh, um, mishandled classified information on her private server in a way that is, uh, is, 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 um, is terribly worrisome. But the truth is we don't know much at all, right? And, and the fact that the Justice Department is actually investigating this, it's a pretty big deal. So I think that's why you have people like Joe Biden and others waiting in the wings. It's a sort of insurance policy in case this scandal you know, grows into something much, much more serious. And does that mean that uh, Bernie Sanders is just another Howard Dean, somebody who's going to have essentially a version of the Trump-like candidates that uh, you, uh, you were talking about on the Republican side in the past? I think so. I think he's like Howard Dean or Gary Hart or Bill Bradley and that you know, he's from Vermont. It's right next door to New Hampshire. And so he's got a lot of appeal up there. People in New Hampshire know him. And I think there's a good chunk of the Democrat electorate that likes to have a sort of challenge from the left against Hillary Clinton, doesn't think she's liberal enough. But I, do, I just don't see him breaking out of the, you know, the 20 to 30 percent that he's pulling in nationally right now, even if he, but he could win a primary, he could win a caucus. But in the, in the long run, um, the, in, he's not even a Democrat, first of all. And in the long run, it'll, it, I, I, I think this on both Trump's sides. Trump's not even a Republican, Trump's so they're Republican. oddly inverses yeah. of one another. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the, you know, look, the parties are not suicidal. The party will, um, will figure out a way to destroy him. Um, I genuinely believe that. And on the Democratic side, I do not think the Democratic Party is going to allow Bernie Sanders to be its nominee. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun to cover, but when voters actually are faced with the choice, um, they get a lot more practical. So it really boils down to that 
unless some disaster happens. It's a Hillary unless she commits a fatal mistake or one of these emails uh, is about her instructing Al Qaeda to attack in Benghazi. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And I so do. who does that leave? We've, uh, the obvious has been Jeb Bush, though now Jeb has actually been a less impressive uh, candidate, it seems, than many people expected, myself included. Yeah. Uh, Rand Paul seems to have, has turned out to be a less electrifying for the libertarian yeah. end of the spectrum. So, so, but does it still default uh, by just naturally to Jeb Bush? Marco Rubio will certainly get another look. When the, when the discussion moves from Trump, if it does, uh, with Rand, I, I don't think he has the staying power. I think the moment, the sort of libertarian moment has ended in the Republican Party, you know, is very much based on an anti-George W. Bush feeling, both on the war and on big government. Um, the rise of ISIS has really changed the foreign policy debate in the Republican Party, and there's we'll talk not- talk about that for yeah, a minute. I think that um, someone like Ted Cruz and, you know, the senators and governors that are the more traditional candidates, they will all have a, they will, a few of them will have another cycle. And um, George, Jeb Bush is the sort of mystery here, right? Because he combines the, the traditional advantage of the front runner, which is a massive, massive fundraising advantage. Between him and his so-called super PAC, they raised over $100 million, much more than any of his competitors. Uh, that means he's going to be in the race to the end, right? Um, and Trump will probably be in the race to the end because he's worth a few billion dollars and he's still funding. Um, on the merits, though, Jeb has been, you know, if you invest, if you were an investor investing in one of these candidates, you'd probably think, like, well, what's going on with Jeb? This isn't so great. His numbers have cratered in New Hampshire and nationally. Um, and he doesn't seem like he's having a whole lot of fun out there if you watch him. You know, some people argue that Donald Trump is the best thing for a guy like Jeb Bush because Trump is basically just sort of holding back all of the other uh, uh, potential anti-Bush candidates. And the, the sort of serious, more normal type candidates like John Kasich or, or even a Scott Walker, but people who would have a, yeah. a record and a competency argument to make, uh, and yet we, we basically can't hear anything about them because of the Trump interference. Nothing. I mean, if you look at the number of minutes that Network News has devoted to Trump versus other candidates, I mean, it's not even close. Um, it's not even close. And how did you react to it that when Jeb Bush was asked about the Iraq invasion and didn't seem to have a well-constructed answer to that? See, that was probably the first sign that despite um, the, his, his, his name and the fact that he's been in presidential politics longer than any, other, any of the other candidates, just by the, you know, virtue of his father and brother's campaigns, that uh, he was a little rusty. Um, but I think it was what it looked like. He wasn't prepared, right? And didn't want to blurt out something that seemed to be negative about his brother, obviously. Someone told me, I was talking to someone who, who, who knows the Bush family pretty well and said, and was relaying a conversation from George W. Bush and said that George W. Bush said for the first time he understood what it was like for his dad when he was running, watching the news all the time and, oh, is my brother going to throw me under the bus or is he going to support me? But this issue will not go away, right? The Bush legacy is the issue that Jeb Bush will have to deal with from now um, you know, until the end of the campaign. And what's the Hillary Clinton uh, version of this same thing? What are the questions that, because she has also I, been so restrictive in how much she's had to say, how many questions she's allowed people to ask her, but what are the landmine questions that, that Hillary could similarly screw up in a way that might change the path of the campaign? Well, so I think it's been a little unfair. I think the coverage in terms of the Bush legacy and how Jeb has had to handle it has been very aggressive. And frankly, that Hillary Clinton has not uh, has not has much scrutiny about how she's handled her husband's legacy. She has come out against the 1994 crime bill, which was one of the signature achievements of the Clinton years, and is now uh, seen by a lot of Democrats as uh, far too punitive, led to you know mass incarceration, um, and has is, is a you know. Um, there were sort of mandatory minimums in that bill. It was a very tough on crime, uh, you know, sort of new Democrat uh, policy that, that Bill Clinton used to be very proud of. And the Democratic Party has changed its mind about that. And to her credit, she's, uh, she's come out against it, right? So there, there, there she is overturning or coming out against one of her husband's signature achievements. Um, on immigration, she's moved to the left from where she was previously. So I think that that, you know, if it's Hillary versus Jeb, um, which is still a chance it will be, both of them are going to have to deal with 
any disagreement that they have uh, on, on the Hillary side with, with her husband and policies in his administration, and of course with Obama. And Jeb will have to deal with uh, disagreements be about uh, policy in both his brother's administration and his father's. A couple other things I want to hit on before we run out of time. One is the media, uh, not just the, 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 where you fit into the media situation, but more broadly. My sense for some time, and I still consider myself part of the media as well, uh, is that the national political reporting core uh, has become increasingly irrelevant to hmm. the entire process. Uh, if you look back over the, certainly 2012, even 2008, it's difficult to identify stories from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal where I worked or the Washington Post uh, that changed the course of the campaign or yeah. that brought some revelation that really affected how the American people <laughs> perceived any particular candidate or policy. But that role that we once thought the media played uh, of getting to the real heart of who these candidates were or revealing their greatest vulnerability, yeah. that just doesn't seem to be there anymore. There are a couple of things going on. One is that the day-to-day -day facts of the campaign, the day-to-day -day reporting, has essentially been commodified, right? It's all online and immediate, and no matter what news site you have, uh, that nugget of news can be, uh, you know, can be packaged in a way on your site or, you know, on a, on, a, on a fleeting tweet. You know, people at the White House, Obama's communications team, who sort of lived through a lot of this transition, they used to talk about this and how, in the beginning, every little story would they, th they think was a sort of nuclear crisis. And then they learned that the t attention span of both the press and the American people is so short that very few of the things that flicker across our screens matter much um, after the fact. And so the result of that, it seems to me, are, are, are two things. One is that when negative stories do come out, when these big revelations do come out, uh, like when, to my astonishment, you had Republican candidates four years ago attacking Mitt Romney on the basis of that he had been a really successful business person. That yeah. was a baffling, <laughs> baffling uh, um, uh, turn of events. Uh, but that all of that had the obvious markings of opposition research that had all been conducted by other campaigns. And so on the one hand, the, that, the negative part of the process has been sort of been taken over by the campaigns. Totally. Yep. But on the other side, you have that the media generally doesn't also doesn't seem to be bringing to the fore some of these bigger issues like the the, the fate of the middle class. Now, I think you're absolutely right. I do. I would say that I think there is more of everything. In other words, I think there is actually more hardcore smart policy journalism out there if you look for it and 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 uh, on, on the on the on the web and find it, um, even though it doesn't necessarily have um, a big audience. But the main group of journalists that are covering the campaign day in and day out are frankly not that interested uh, in policy. So there's a good chance we won't see you again uh, before a new president has actually been selected. So this is our opportunity to, one, ask you, uh, what's, your, what's your sense of the, of the Obama administration, the Obama presidency at this stage of the game? You know, he inherited a very messy world and, a, and a, an entirely new sort of national security state from George W. Bush. Right, so a lot of his first term was sort of adjusting, figuring out what do I keep, you know, what do I, what do I adjust. I think on domestic policy, um, I think his, his legacy looks, looks decent, depending on how a few things turn out. Uh, and on climate change, I think he did about as much as he could, um, but, you know, maybe, uh, maybe could have tried a little harder in the, in the, in the first term. I think, those, I think he was right and he identified the issues that needed tackling in that first term. I think he made the right choices, that health care, climate change, rescuing the economy were the big things. It's certainly easy to make the case that once he's out of office, as you say, when politicians are no longer in the fray, they get much more popular. Absolutely. His numbers are rising dramatically already. He's gone from 32 percent to 42 percent approval in many places in a relatively short period of time. Yeah. The economy is, uh, despite some of the recent events in China, is going to be going great guns uh, for the next year. Uh, historic levels of unemployment, these major legislative achievements, um, the health care bill, and the quagmire in the Middle East is going to be successfully handed off to the next guy and still be remembered mostly as a problem that George Bush started with the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard to, to not conclude that as time goes by, he becomes a Martin Luther King kind of figure as the first black president with a very successful presidency. But yeah. so what's your final call? Uh, on Barack Obama, failed president, as the Republicans would say, or Mount Rushmore? No, I, I don't. 
I mean, we, we reassess presidents all the time, right? I mean, Eisenhower was considered kind of a nobody until the last 10 or 20 years. So Mount Rushmore, we're too polarized in this country to ever again decide as a country who we would put on Mount Rushmore, right? There's no modern president, no modern president that Democrats and Republicans would ever agree on anymore. So, so nobody, <laughs> you know, nobody, Obama's probably not destined uh, for Mount Rushmore, but I think you're absolutely right that uh, his presidency will be considered historic. Ryan Lizzo of the New Yorker Magazine, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Doug. We hope you'll join the conversation with American Forum and our guests by following us on Twitter at Miller underscore Center or at Douglas Blackman. To send us a comment about this program or download podcasts or transcripts, visit us at MillerCenter.org American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next week.